David is Stanton is a retired Navy commander. He's going to come speak to us today, so he'll bless us with his message. Next week we'll be back to um, a message. We'll do communion next week, and then Yankee Arnold will be here the next week. So a lot going on, so it's exciting. So, um, Mr. David Stanton, if you'd come forward, please. And children, you may be released to go to junior church and to nursery. So just follow the, follow the kids. Don't run too fast. Recognize her, Larry? <laughs> that was my ship from 81, 80 to 83, and Brother Larry was on there from, what, 84 to 86? Yeah. Oh, okay. My billion-dollar home, our billion-dollar home. Let's see. Did I do that right? Okay. Good morning and happy Father's Day uh, to my fellow dads. I know I'm very grateful for my dad. Uh, my dad passed on uh, exactly a week before uh, Christmas Eve in 01, and I was reminded at that time that when I was four and a half, my dad got crumpled up newspaper in his Christmas stocking, and I don't really remember what my reaction to that was at the time, but I very vividly re recall what happened Christmas my, when I was five and a half. My mom took my sister and I to see Santa Claus, and the first thing I did when I got on his lap was start saying, how come you put crumpled up newspaper in my daddy's stocking? He's a good daddy. <laughs> and Santa Claus is like, this kid's chewing me out. <laughs> and I, I didn't see what my mom was doing. She was probably holding back uh, laughter. But anyway, uh, since I got saved 46 and a half years ago, the large majority of Mother's Day messages I've heard talked about how wonderful moms are and how rotten dads are. On Father's Day, the messages get reversed and talk about how rotten dads are and then how mo wonderful moms are. Uh, we're not having any of that today. Our message is on baptism. Uh, all quotes are from the NASB. Uh, I'll break it down into four sections uh, with an acrostic amen. Uh, baptism's application, method, eligibility, and the fact that it's not a component of salvation, parts one and two. Applicability. God's word mentions several types of baptism. This message is only about biblical water baptism, so it only applies to people who consider themselves to be Christians, whether they really are or not. In John 15, 13, John said, greater love is no, no one than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. My personal corollary to this verse is, greater hatred has no one than this, that a person encourage a lost person into believing that he or she is saved. In Galatians 4.16, Paul asks, so have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? Far too many answer that yes. In Proverbs 27, 6, Solomon states, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Nothing in this message <coughs> can legitimately be interpreted as a personal attack on anybody uh, who doesn't hold to biblical baptism. This message merely attacks anti-Christian doctrine, which can send people to hell and implements Paul's ex uh, example of 2 Corinthians 10.5. We are destroying arguments and all arrogance raised against the knowledge of God. And, <coughs> and we will, uh, and we are taking every 
thought captive to the obedience of Christ. All Christians recognize King Jesus as not only the Son of God, but also as God the Son. Anybody who fails to understand that Jesus is God is currently destined for hell. We pray that you repent of your willing ignorance, but that is your current trajectory. Demonstrating the truth of Jesus' deity is the subject of another message because I don't have enough time to go into huge remedial foundations. Since God is a God of order and logic, please follow his logic here. Jesus is God. Therefore, he is infinite by definition. That means his sacrifice was infinite. That means there cannot be anything lacking in his sacrifice for the salvation of those who accept his free gift. That means human beings are incapable of augmenting Jesus' work on the cross. But if a person must do anything in addition to Christ's completed work on the cross, this inescapably implies that Jesus' sacrifice was somehow lacking. If there is anything lacking in Jesus' sacrifice, then his sacrifice was not infinite. If his sacrifice was not infinite, then uh, that can only mean that Jesus is not infinite. If, <coughs> if Jesus is not infinite, then he cannot be God. Therefore, any suggestion that a human must perform any work in addition to Christ's sacrifice in order to be saved is a direct denial of the deity of Christ. Anybody who denies the deity of Christ is lost. Therefore, no matter how religious you feel, if you believe that Jesus' sacrifice must be augmented by your baptism or anything else, then you are lost. If you are trusting in Jesus plus, you are lost. Not only do words mean things, but beliefs have consequences, and wrong beliefs have self-destructive consequences. Our sin debt to God is infinite. Anybody who does not understand that his or her sin debt to God is infinite is lost. Jesus had to pay all of our sin debt for us. If Jesus paid, uh, only paid 99% of our sin debt, we would still have to pay 1% of infinity ourselves. What is 1% of infinity? It's still infinity. If Jesus paid 99.9999% of our sin debt, that still does, does us no good. Our sin debt would remain infinity. I, but more importantly, Jesus, beg you to repent. He died for your entire sin debt because you can pay for none of it. If you might, uh, you might as well try to pay off God with monopoly money. If you believe that Jesus' sacrifice paid for anything less than 100% uh, of your sin debt, then you are trusting in yourself. Uh, to make up for your infinite shortfall. If you are trusting in yourself to make up for your infinite shortfall, then you effectively uh, believe that you have infinite resources and capabilities. If you believe you have infinite resources and capabilities, then you believe you are equal with God, you believe that you are your own savior, which means you are worshiping yourself. Method. I once attended a Lutheran wedding where my oldest stepson 
uh, asked why they had a birdbath in their sanctuary. <clears throat> the fact that uh, biblical water baptism requires immersion is beyond all honest debate because the original Greek word baptizo actually means to immerse. The only reason there are English-speaking birdbath baptizers uh, today is that the Romanist and Anglican translators, Martin Luther was a great man who did much to rescue him, mankind from Satan's clutches, but the Roman church was and still is so evil, corrupt, and satanic that one man could only do so much in one lifetime. Baptism is one area where Luther couldn't overcome his Romanist brainwashing. One of the most despicable blasphemies I've ever heard uttered by a Protestant was said to me by a Lutheran pastor. I used to be a Romanist uh, myself, and he used to be a Pentecostal. I said, while I don't agree with Pentecostals on everything, uh, there is at least a larger percentage of born-again believers among them than that of the Romanists. He said, well, I don't know about that, since all Catholics are baptized as babies and not all Pentecostals are baptized. He was implying that baby sprinkling of Catholic babies defined or conferred the second birth. Just think of how many hundreds of millions of people are burning in hell today because they were taught that their birdbath baptism and passing a test in eighth grade ensured them that they were true Christians. When I express my contempt for their paganistic pseudo-baptism, remember that I do not blame Martin Luther uh, for it. Infant sprinkling was a Romanist invention, not a Lutheran invention. Peter, uh, Paul describes baptism as a burial. In Romans 6, 3 to 4, he says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. In Colossians 2.12, he says, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through the faith in, working, uh, in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Of the three versions of baptism practiced today, sprinkling, pouring, and immersion, only immersion adequately pictures burial. Jesus was baptized by immersion. Mark 1, 9 to 10 says, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John uh, in the Jordan. And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. Matthew 3, 13 to 16 also says, then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John trying to prevent him saying, tried to prevent him saying, I have the need to be baptized by you, and yet you are coming to me? But Jesus answered, uh, Jesus answering said to him, allow it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. After he was baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and settled on him. Many years ago, I saw a painting which supposedly depicted Jesus' baptism. It, he and John were standing chest deep in the Jordan, and John was pouring water out in a, uh, from a pitcher over Jesus' head. Can you imagine anything that ludicrous? Hey guys, get me a pitcher. Even though we're chest deep in, in a river, I still need a pitcher to pour water over people. 
And how much more ridiculous if he had sprinkled anybody while they were out there in the water like that. Just think of the mental, moral, and theological gymnastics it would take to paint such a rendering. Jesus came to us for many reasons. One was to set his example for us <clears throat> to follow. The next verses uh, describe several different contexts where he set his example for us, but everything Jesus did during his pre-ascension ministry, including his baptism, was given to us as an example. John 3, 15, uh, excuse me, John 13, 15, says, for I gave you an example so that you also would do just as I did for you. First, uh, First Peter 2.21 says, uh, for you have been called for this purpose because Christ also, uh, also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you would follow in his steps. In 1 Corinthians 11.1, Peter commands, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. He also told the Philippians and the Thessalonians to follow his example in Philippians 3.15 and 2 Thessalonians 3.7. As a short rabbit trail, uh, this is exactly why Jesus never unilaterally unilaterally wielded his own divine capabilities. All his miracles resulted from his father's responses to Jesus' purity of faith and devotion to his father's will. If Jesus had worked miracles uh, by wielding his own divine capabilities, that would have provided no example at all because we don't have his divine capabilities. But when our faith is properly placed and uh, we ask for things in accordance with the Father's will, we are promised uh, uh, the Father promises to answer us just as he pr answered his son. When Jesus was baptized, he didn't need to repent, nor did he quote, become a Christian, unquote, as some blasphemously and preposterously allege. He was baptized and by immersion as an example for us. It is true that there may be some exceptionally rare isolated situations where physical disabilities or severe health concerns may interfere with immersing a true believer, but these exceptions do not change God's command for the vast majority of his children. Likewise, there may be temporary circumstances which could delay a believer's being baptized. But once properly instructed regarding God's command for true biblical baptism, the obedient Christian will purpose in his or her heart to get baptized as soon as possible. The thief on the cross is an example of temporary circumstances preventing him from being baptized. Some claim that the thief on the cross doesn't count. How convenient, uh, because that was before the resurrection. However, Jesus was also baptized before he was resurrected. Eligibility. Jesus commanded believers baptism. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus commanded, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Notice Jesus' order, make disciples first, then baptize them. Mark 16, 15 to 16, also records Jesus commanding, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The one who has believed and has been baptized will be saved, but the one who has not believed will be condemned. Once again, the order is belief first, then baptism, and the one who doesn't believe will be condemned. Jesus does not say, and the one who doesn't believe and has not been baptized will be condemned. 
Philip practiced uh, believer's baptism while preaching to the Samaritans and to the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts 8.12 documents, but when they believed Philip as he was preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were being baptized. Acts 8.35 to 39, Uh, relates, then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from that, this scripture, he pre preached Jesus to him. As they, were, uh, as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And he ordered the, uh, that the chariot stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him when they came up out of the water. The spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away and the eunuch all, no longer saw him, but he went on his way rejoicing. Again, down into the water and came up out of the water, can only describe immersion. But in both cases, the Samaritans and the eunuch believed first and, and baptized afterward. Peter preached believer's baptism as recorded in Acts 2.38. Uh, Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter exhorted the crowd to achieve biblical repentance, which leads to salvation, and then be baptized. Acts 10.44-48 records, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell uh, upon all those who were listening to the message. All the Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had also been poured out onto the, uh, onto the Gentiles, for, there were, for they were hearing them speaking it with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter responded, surely, no one can refuse the water for uh, refuse the water for these to be baptized, who have uh, received the Holy Spirit, just as we did, Kenny, and he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Notice Peter's order also: repent, then believe, and then baptize after they've received the Holy Spirit. There is no reasonable or rational excuse, much less a biblical excuse. For baby sprinkling, nowhere in scripture is there any instance of anybody getting baptized before getting saved. No babies or children were ever baptized in scripture, nor was this ever commanded or even suggested. God's word prescribes biblical, excuse me, believer's baptism. So-called infant baptisms are entirely a Romanist invention designed to bilk more money out of the common people who were prevented from knowing scripture by the papists. Paul did not believe that baptism was a prerequisite for salvation. If he had, he would never have said in 1 Corinthians 1.14, I am thankful that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. The salvation of souls was Paul's most cherished goal and primary purpose for living, it would be perfectly absurd for Paul to be so ambivalent about baptizing people while also believing that people weren't really saved without baptism. Paul did not believe baptism was prerequisite to salvation because he himself was saved prior to his baptism, as he recounts in these excerpts from Acts 22, 6 through 16. Approaching Damascus, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, 
get up and go on to, into Damascus, and there you will be told about everything that has been appointed for you to do. Ananias came to me and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And he said, The God of our fathers has, has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear a message from his mouth, for you will be a witness for him. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins by calling on his name. By the way, did you notice Jesus' first two words when Paul asked him uh, who he was, Jesus started off with, I am. Amen. You can bet Paul knew exactly what that meant. I had actually never uh, noticed that before yesterday. Not a component of salvation, part one. Faith alone. Salvation is by grace through faith. Human beings are not capable of adding to Christ's completed work on the cross. Any attempt to do so spits in God's face and tramples on the blood of his son. God only, says, God only has to say something once for it to be true, but here is only a small sampling of the many verses which proclaim the total sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice. Acts 10.43 says, All the prophets testify of him that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Acts 15.11 says, But we believe that we, have, that we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus in the same way that they, i.e. the Gentiles, uh, also are. Acts 16.30-31 says, and after he, the Philippian jailer, uh, brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Dr. Luke records nothing in these verses about bap needing baptism to be saved. Romans 1.17 says, For in it, i.e. the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous one will live by faith. Romans 5.1 states, Therefore, having just been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10.9-13 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person uh, believes, resulting in righteousness, and with, his, with your mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all abounding in riches for all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul doesn't record anything in these verses about needing baptism to be saved either. Galatians 3, 1 to 7. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was port publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Do you suffer so many, uh, did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does uh, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works, mir uh, works miracles among you do it by works of the law or by hearing them with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, therefore recognize that it is uh, those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 
says, for by grace you are, have been saved, have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. None of these verses say anything about baptism being part of salvation. Even when comparing baptism with circumcision, faith came first. Romans 4.3 says, what does, the scripture, excuse me, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Here we see that even circumcision followed salvation. Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness in Genesis 15.6, but he was not circumcised until Genesis 17.11-14. Much later, all male Israelites were required to be circumcised on the eighth day, but what does Paul say about these involuntary rituals? In Romans 9, 6 to 7, he says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. Their circumcision was merely a fleshly national identification and had nothing to do with their individual salvation. Guess I missed one. <clears throat> Not a component of salvation part two, faith isn't, uh, faith plus isn't faith. More of God's divine mathematics. Faith plus works equals works. Romans 11.6 illustrates this. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, since otherwise grace is no longer works. If you mix one gallon of salt water with one gallon of fresh water, you get two gallons of salt water. The baptism uh, controversy of today is directly anal uh, analogous to the circumcision controversy of Paul's day. In, Gen uh, excuse me, in Galatians 5.12, Paul says, I wish that those who are troubling you would even emasculate themselves. Paul wished that those advocates of mandatory circumcision Sorry about that. <clears throat> would not stop at cutting off the tip. He wished they would cut off everything they had. By today's politically correct compromiser Laodicean standards, Paul would be judged as quite mean-spirited, unloving, and judgmental. The baptismal equivalent analogy for Paul's attitude toward the Judaizers, who were also polluting the gospel, would be I wish those who are troubling you about baptism would just go out and drown themselves. Both biblical Christianity and all of Satan's knockoffs recognize that salvation and works are inextricably linked. I don't say cheap knockoffs because their price is infinity. What differentiates biblical Christianity from all of Satan's knockoffs is the order in which they come and which is the cause versus which is the effect. All of Satan's counterfeits teach that some sort of work is required uh, first and causes the salvation. Biblical uh, Christianity is the only theology on the planet which teaches that God's, uh, teaches God's truth. Salvation must come first. Then our, our gratitude 
and obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit necessarily causes the works. This is what differentiates a Christian from a non-Christian or a believer from a make-believer or unbelievers. It is partially correct to say that man did not add baptism as a requirement for salvation. Satan did. Unfortunately, man's sinful flesh, ever desiring to justify itself and earn some part of salvation, readily swallows the bait. Some cultists try to shoehorn Jesus' John 3, 5 statement into their heresy while conveniently leaving out what he said just 11 verses later. John 3, 5 states, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. But literally 90 seconds later, read it for yourself out loud with a stopwatch. Jesus continued in verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus' most famous and definitive statement of the gospel contains zero mention of water or baptism. Jesus agrees with himself. Placing your faith in his completed work is comprehensively sufficient for salvation, period. The bottom line, uh, it is clear that baptism is not optional for the true believer in Jesus Christ. However, like every other good work God has for us, baptism follows salvation. It, is nothing to do, it has nothing to do with bringing about salvation. Baptism has, uh, was given by God as the first act of obedience for a new believer. Baptism is an external display of an already accomplished internal reality. It is a physical act of the will performed for a theological purpose, i.e. a religious work, publicly declaring the true believers in the identification with and unity in Christ Jesus. We do not depend on baptism for any part of our salvation. In baptism, we proclaim our gratitude to God for the already, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the already accomplished fact of our salvation, and we submit to his command. Just because he said so, isn't that enough? He who has an ear, let him hear. Pastor. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, just to make sure we all understand this, once you trust Christ as your personal Savior because he died on a cross for your sins, you have everlasting life. If you go 30 years and never get baptized, water baptized, you're still going to spend eternity in heaven. Okay, it's a matter of obedience, just like it's a matter of obedience to go to church, a matter of obedience to take communion. God wants us to do these things, but it's a matter of you deciding, to, you know, going to do that. So if you trust Christ as Savior, he came and died for your sins, you will have everlasting life forever. But then it's after follows is do we, are we going to obey him by doing this, this, and this? You still will go to heaven, you still have eternal life. Because salvation, as Dave was saying, is based on what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So. I hope just everybody understands that and makes sense. So thank you, Dave. Um, we're going to have a final song here in just a second. But after that, we're going to have the breakfast bar open up, and we'll end our service and enjoy yourself and fellowship together. So let's go ahead and sing our final song, which is going to be I Know Whom I Have Believed. And first of all, I will go ahead and close in prayer, then we'll sing this song. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for for blessing us, giving us salvation as a free gift, that all we have to do is accept that gift. And Lord, we just thank you so much for this day for, to celebrate fathers and especially our Heavenly Father and all that you've did for us when you died on the cross for our sins. Lord, just thank you so much for what you've done. Bring us back again next Thursday and next Sunday just to worship and, and just to praise you for all that you've done. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen.